Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, it's a huge privilege to be speaking at the Prince Mahadol Award Conference in front of such a distinguished audience. And it's a particular honor for me because, as you, as you have heard, I am relatively new to the world of global health, having spent most of my career in business and finance. And my background brings both advantages and disadvantages. The obvious disadvantage is that I have much to learn about the pathogens themselves, about prophylactic and therapeutic approaches, about the intricacies of global health institutions and mechanisms. The advantage is that I can bring a fresh perspective, that I can ask the stupid questions, that I can help connect the world of global health with the worlds of business and finance, a connection that often seems quite flimsy and rife with suspicion and misunderstandings. Turning to the topic of this conference, making the world safer, my view on the infectious disease threat can be summed up in the phrase, the neglected dimension of global security. This phrase was also the title of the report on pandemics produced by the commission I chaired on behalf of the US National Academy of Medicine. When you frame the risk of infectious diseases as a human and economic security issue, it seemed pretty clear that we haven't yet got our act together sufficiently to protect mankind. Few risks could cause the loss of millions of lives in the way a highly contagious and virulent influenza pandemic could. Few risks could cause as much economic damage as the fear sparked by an infectious disease outbreak. Yet we devote a fraction of the resources we deploy to other risks of war, of financial crises, of nuclear disasters, even of climate change, to preventing, preparing for, and responding to infectious disease threats. And on top of the risk of infectious disease outbreaks, we face the real and growing threat of antimicrobial resistance, a peril that exacerbates the dangers of individual pathogens and if unaddressed could render unsustainable large swathes of modern clinical practice. These twin threats, one episodic and easy to ignore when it's not happening, the other creeping up on us inevitably and inexorably, combine to pose huge dangers to global health security and we neglect them at our peril. This is not to diminish the many actions that have been and are being taken to make the world safer from such threats. On infectious diseases, there have been many positive steps in the wake of the Ebola crisis, including the launch of the joint external evaluation process, the establishment of the WHO's emergency program as described by Dr. Tedros, and the creation of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. Yet I think we all know that if you rigorously scrutinize the three crucial domains of national preparedness, our scientific tools, and our global coordination capabilities, there are still yawning gaps. Likewise on AMR, the Global Action Plan was a big step forward, and there are many great initiatives on surveillance, stewardship, responsible use, and towards the development of new antibiotics, vaccines, and diagnostics. We should recognize these achievements, but we should also be realistic. There's still a huge amount to be done. Moreover, when we talk about potential risks to global health security, to making people safe, we implicitly tolerate a base level of human loss and economic burden that really shouldn't be acceptable. AIDS, TB, and malaria alone killed three million people in 2015. These are infectious diseases we have the tools to prevent and treat. And the economic burden on the hardest afflicted countries is enormous. Those who are sick and the carers who look after them 
cannot contribute to economic development. Now, I know that most discussions on global health security focus on emerging infectious diseases with epidemic or pandemic potential, or on the perils of AMR, rather than on endemic infectious disease. And I myself have been guilty of this. But I think we need to rethink this way of framing the discussion about global security. It's an odd definition of security that only focuses on the things that might kill you and excludes those that are actually killing you. Asking political leaders in poor countries to do more to counter potential threats from infectious diseases seems rather perverse when actual threats from existing infectious diseases are already killing tens or hundreds of thousands of their citizens. Of course, it does make sense to protect against potentially catastrophic tail risk events. And the constellation of threats to lives and livelihoods does look very different if you're sitting in London, Paris, or New York, where the likes of malaria, cholera, yellow fever, and dengue are absent, and TB and AIDS increasingly well controlled, rather than in a village in the DRC or Mekong. But my view is that strengthening health security has to start from tackling the diseases that are killing people now. And consider the example of AIDS. Emerging in the 70s, AIDS was then the emerging infectious disease that turned into a terrible global pandemic that has killed 35 million people. And despite massive reductions in mortality rates, AIDS still kills about one million people per year. But nowadays, we don't typically talk about AIDS when we talk about health security. And it would seem slightly bizarre, I think, to someone coming to the topic afresh as to why the biggest pandemic we've had in recent decades isn't part of that discussion. Taking a more integrated approach to health security, encompassing both endemic and emerging diseases, makes sense from a practical perspective. Too often, the multiple agendas, initiatives, institutions that characterize the global health space compete rather than collaborate and sometimes only accidentally leverage the synergies between them. Yet much of what we do to tackle individual diseases involves building capabilities and infrastructure that can serve multiple purposes. Community health workers, supply chains, diagnostic labs, disease surveillance, infection control regimes, vector control. Without diluting our focus and accountability for our respective missions, we can get smarter about working together to build stronger and more resilient health systems that can achieve multiple purposes and respond to multiple challenges. Another practical reason for taking an integrated approach is that the roots of the next emerging threat can, uh, can arise from or be intertwined in today's problem. Drug-resistant TB is a good example. About a third of total antibiotic-resistant deaths are caused by MDR-XDR-TB. So if we want to really truly address the MR challenge, we have to tackle the TB challenge. And more generally, the increasing incidence of resistance, whether to ARVs in AIDS or to artemisinin or pyrethroids in malaria, poses threats that could take us backwards if we don't address them. And given the scale of these diseases, any slip up is measured in tens or hundreds of thousands of lives. So I have five quick, five quick messages. First, the global health community has to get better at articulating what's at stake in making the world safer from infectious disease threats, both in terms of lives and economics. At a time when Many of our public leaders seem afflicted by tunnel vision, seemingly only interested in what's happening within their borders or within their term of office. We need to be pointing out that viruses don't need visas and don't respect election timetables. Winning the argument means we have to spend more time talking to people outside the global health arena, not preaching to the converted, and we have to use their language their ways of thinking about risks, their ways of thinking about the economics. 
And we need to, we need to recognize that some of the distinctions that are part of normal discourse in the global health arena, the distinction between epidemic and endemic bacteria and virus, they may seem straightforward in this world, but they're completely confusing to many of the policymakers we, whose support we need to win. Second, we need to talk about health security in a way that makes sense both to taxpayers in rich countries and to the people most at risk from infectious disease. Those living in poor, often marginalized communities, in slums, in border areas, in zones of conflict. Making these people safer from diseases they haven't got makes little sense to them when they're dying from diseases they do have. I understand that people in rich countries are inevitably going to be most interested in being protected against new threats that might affect them directly. But to exaggerate to make the point, if global health security is seen as code for making only those who live in the rich world safer from infectious disease threats, then it's both dodgy morally and won't be effective as a strategy. It, it, it ignores the fact that new threats are most likely to emerge in the places and amongst the populations where endemic diseases are most prevalent and that by tackling one, we build better defenses against the other. As Dr. Tedros said, health security is only as strong as the weakest link. Third, we have to embed and broaden our approach to antimicrobial resistance so that AMR becomes an integral component of how we tackle infectious disease rather than something separate as it can sometimes seem. And without diminishing the threat of antibiotics, we need AMR to encompass other forms of resistance. One example of real relevance to this region, if it spreads and worsens, the artemisinin resistance we're seeing in the Mekong could reverse the great advances we've made in reducing malaria mortality. Fourth, we do need to get better at working together to tackle specific diseases and to build stronger, more resilient health systems. Although there's fabulous work being done by dedicated professionals across every aspect of global health, the impact of such efforts can sometimes be diminished or eroded by fragmentation, duplication, and poor coordination. And this need for effective collaboration stretches beyond those focused on human health into animal health, housing, and education. We need to make the rhetoric of One Health practical and pervasive so that it becomes the norm rather than a set of individual initiatives we celebrate. We need to minimize institutional turf battles, and we need to find better models of collaborating with the private sector. I don't pretend to have a magic wand to achieve all this, but I can promise you that under my leadership, the Global Fund will take a big picture view of its mission and a collaborative approach towards achieving its goals. Finally, we need to ensure that considerations of gender equality inform health security strategies in a powerful, practical, and effective way. You only have to look at HIV infection rates among young women and girls in certain parts of Africa to realize that women often get the short end of the stick when it comes to protection from health risks. And this despite the fact that from society's perspective, protecting women's health is arguably more important than protecting men's, given the knock-on impact on child health. When we talk about making people safer, we need to be talking about making all people safer. Together, we have the opportunity to make humankind much, much safer from the threat of infectious diseases, saving millions of lives and supporting and protecting broader socioeconomic development. In many, if not in most areas, we already have the tools and strategies that work. We should take our inspiration from Prince Mahidol, 
He was a visionary and a pioneer in bringing health to the people. This conference is his legacy. We should use this conference to work together, to lift our game, to work out how we execute more effectively, to work out how we collaborate to greater impact. Thank you very much.